Okay, this is part two, and you actually find the, the link to the presentation at the bottom of the YouTube page. So why the safety bar in the use here of this squat pattern? Well, what I found was it's a lower body stressor. You can do, um, it's a huge global stressor. When I say that, like, I got huge hormonal responses from this and when I say that because this is why we train is to get hormone responses um, to get more muscular for power athletes and um, it also was a way to go super maximal loading and put less loading on the spine I've done this as I said for seven eight years with super maximal loading and have never had a back problem kids that can't back squat can actually do this they found um, it's just a better position. Shoulders are in better position. Yes, we do hold on to the uh, bar in front. Why? For stability. We're using super maximal loads. Now, one of the key things is there's a safety squat bar or a safety bar there, safety bar there. So we put them in a really good position. So when they're close, if they miss the lift, they only drop a few inches, like four or five at the most. Okay. Um, what this does is very sport specific in regards to the eccentric in the isometric phase if you understand triphasic training and when I say that what this does is remodel tissue okay and we'll talk more about that but people ask me well why do you have the hands on the bar because we're not worried about stability we, um, some of my athletes have had 800 pounds on the bar we don't need stability this is about adaptation okay um, what about core stability they said well um, when we scan our athletes with a DEXA scan, my athletes that have been through a couple training cycles with this concept have extremely um, large amounts of muscle mass through their core and midsection. And we don't do a whole lot of core training. So I'm just telling you this is the benefits from this bar. Okay. Now why super maximal loading? It means more than you can actually lift yourself. Um, what you have is, again, we get maximum adaptations at 120 to 100 percent load okay versus using the normal let's say triphasic at 90 to 70 percent okay we've seen huge uh, hormonal release okay when I say that I have had confirmed blood tests and various other measurement tools that I can say the hormones go through the roof with the super maximal loading in regards to uh, growth hormone testosterone now one thing that I do do um, I usually control cortisol the sets are often kept under 10 seconds so I might do a 5 second set a 7 second set or a 10 second set I'll often do them in maybe potentiation clusters or various clusters okay um, one of the thing if you want more understanding of why I do this in the uh, under 10 seconds what I'll do is I'll actually hyperlink this to my YouTube talk the bio uh, bioenergetics integration dynamics I will hyperlink that and there's about a 40 minute conversation upon this of why I do it that way okay so here's the big thing like this lift can be done if you look at a 20 week triphasic complete cycle okay you got your base building here, which is part of Ben Peterson's and my uh, the GPP model in his dissertation, which will be a book that comes out in the near future. Um, we have the true triphasic, the eccentric, the isometric, the concentric. Um, it doesn't have to be done this way. Triphasic can be done in different phases with larger gaps. Doesn't matter. Power and peaking. Okay, but what you might and some people say, well, I don't have 20 weeks. I don't either. Always. But what I do have is a compressed triphasic model that's a hack. And if you actually want to understand this whole concept, and you can see this 20 week week um, training program, it has all the qualities. Even this one, I didn't draw the line. But this 8 to 10 week program has the same as the 20. You won't get all the results. If you want more information, just click on the hack video or right here when you uh, look at the presentation for the link below on the YouTube channel okay it's very useful in all training cycles okay from from you saw the 800 pound super maximal back squat uh, with one of my elite throwers to using this at light loads at 25 percent now this is just a video for demonstration my athletes would go a lot faster explode up they'd go down harder and faster and they would explode up but I, and we don't always have them bring the knee up but my point is with the knee 
is that you can actually make it a little bit more dynamic if you're working on speed training but you see this is the same lift as the super maximal loading now yes my athlete here um former athlete uh he's not my athlete but he was a former athlete his knee goes in front of his toe there's a reason for that um i think that's a pretty good lift with the safety bar squats here's one of the better ones in my opinion for power speed and explosive i'll actually pair these together so let me and, and when, I, when I explain this, so the athlete, if you take a quick look, he's got bands hooked to the racks. He's got weights on the hex deadlift bar. The bands wrap around the handles. And he is getting pulled extremely fast and explosive. And when I say that, I have force plates that measure this. And this athlete can produce three to five times the force on this lift alone than he can with a power clean or a snatch. Yes. I know there might be some Olympic lifting coaches having heart attacks right now. Yes. This lift is much superior for athletes when they do uh, this type of lift for power, speed, and explosion. Not to get strong. Not to, not to learn to Olympic lift. Because I love Olympic lifts. But... It's not even close in the regards to the power, the speed, and the joint stiffness that this lift can cause. Okay, so very useful. My point is, is all these training cycles, this lift can be used through all of them. Okay, so how to implement it? Basically, the tempos, we use tempos on, uh, we use uh, time training, which if you look again for the bioenergetics talk that I produce you'll see that on monday we use basically seven seconds on fridays 10 um here's the loading model we use 120 to 110 percent and then on friday we use about 110 to 105 percent if you did a three-day loading model we do pairing with french contrast training and look at my exercises prehab exercises okay we use safety bar again with this now we also use uh you can look at weight releasers um it's not an example of how we use weight release or the safety bar, but instead of using super maximal only with with the bar, okay, or with the uh, with just the weight, so you can put 300 pounds on the bar and add another 100 150 pounds on the weight releaser, so it's a little safer. So when the athlete gets to the bottom, if you've never seen these before, they release off, and now the athlete can move more weight up. So we use that actually with our safety bar squat. Okay, now here's the big thing. I don't know uh, if I can get that. I'll try to be quick. There's a hack for this lift. Okay, and that hack is definitely um, that hack is definitely. Let me go back. I'm gonna try to get that. I'll stop it. I'm gonna go here. If I have to exit that, I'm gonna exit it. And I'm going to go there. So here's where we're at. If you don't have the safety bar squat, I like the open-ended where there's a uh, safe or a hex deadlift. You can even use it with the hex deadlift. Maybe if you uh, put your uh, put the back bar in between your legs. But this is a way to hack it if you don't have the safety bar. If you want to start it tomorrow, very effective lift. Here you go. Partners help you up and you take it eccentrically down now isometrically you'd pause it right there and hold it just off the ground for the time frame that you wish whether it was seven or ten seconds okay and actually how we do the seven and ten second sets the athletes usually pair that with somebody so this athlete would go for ten seconds whether he was iso or eccentric and then his partner would go and jump in there and do the, the left leg. And then he would jump back in after his partner did the left leg and he would do his right leg. So when I say cluster this, we usually do uh, cluster sets with this type of loading. Okay, now let me go back to this. Um, present, there we go, should be set. So again, you have the loading models, the, the possibilities, the hacks, coaching cues when we do this, neutral spine chest up front and back leg uh at 90 degrees okay uh belly breath in out uh we hold breath with uh we hold their breath 
why they do the lift. Uh, let me bring this up. When I say this, he's coming down. He's actually holding his breath. He'll actually hold his breath with his breath in. Okay, now there's two points here. We'll hold with the breath in to help stabilize the spine. Okay, and then what happens is the next thing we also do is uh, the rule we tell our athletes they can't pass out. This is why you put the safety bars. I've never had anybody pass out, but we're holding our breath. This is the vascular system adaptations that we're causing. Now, as they get deeper now, you'll see that he started his lift. Let's go back to the very start. He started his lift right at mid-range. The reason for that is if he starts it at the top, it's not as effective because he's so strong there and it's not a disadvantaged position. So we actually go to the bottom half and do this lift to get maximum damage. And you can see some of my other uh, training methods that I talk about getting maximum damage during the eccentrics. Now, yes, he'll be doing super maximal loading. He will keep his heel off the ground to strengthen his foot. Okay, because many people don't have a strong enough foot that play athletics. This is why my athletes can do more plyos than, than most everyone else. That's the exact reason. And we, again, we use this time frame to strengthen themselves. Now we'll do this, then we go on to a French contrast maybe. We do all types of methods of, of training uh, with this lift also. Okay, so we hold breath in, okay, uh, slow move consent, we, oh, another big coaching tool is that we fire the big toe, we squeeze that big toe while the heel's off the ground, and then we kind of explode up, theoretically you can't, but we have with the uh, two spotters and maybe somebody in the back, that actually happens, okay, so the ISO, you can see it's kind of the same training load, same concept, With we also have the hex bar, but some of the things about the ISO is that uh, with the isometric, when we do it, again, we will do the isometric load. And when he goes to the bottom and he's holding his position, what will transpire is he's holding his breath while, uh, with his air in. And then he's in the deep position, holding, holding, and someone will tell him to go up. He's holding his heel off the ground. Okay. Um, there's tension in the big toe, squeezing the toe in towards the, the, the middle of the foot, and he'll explode up, hopefully at the end with the help of the spotters, okay? Pretty simple. Um, you can see that it's the same thing, glutes, spotters, uh, control descent into the bottom position if he can. Okay, so... What we have, why we value the isometrics, let's say, or the eccentrics, okay, creates huge resiliency towards injury, increases the potential the rate of force development if you go through an eccentric cycle. Um, it also is, people talk about absorbing force. There's uh, not a better athlete prepared if you do super maximal eccentrics during your training, okay, with this lift they'll be able to stop on a dime and change directions, okay? Um, it might not come right away. Let's say you do eccentrics for two weeks. It may take two more to three more weeks to see that transition, okay? Um, but you will get maximum stress on fast twitch fibers during this time. And trust me, that's what you want to train if you're in a speed and power sport. You also get fast twitch hypertrophy, okay? Now, obviously what happens, this is long story short, is the uh, the sarcomeres like it, understand if you remodel the tissue okay and the length of these are in a new position and these are farther apart then when the muscle contracts it contracts at a higher velocity so the contraction is more powerful okay I gave you a quick summary of that I'm, this is not the video to do that in but what I'm telling you is that eccentric muscle contraction you will contract your muscles at a higher velocity because you reposition the very little small inner workings of the muscle um, during the eccentric training phase. Okay, now the isometric contraction. What has happened during the 
eccentric is that you created new tissue and new remodeling of the tissue. You made that tissue um, thicker, stronger. Now what happens is you go into isometric and you re you now teach that new tissue to become strong, especially in the weakest positions, especially the joint specific positions. So when when you see people get into that deep squat position, they're stronger because they're isometrically stronger in there. And people say, well, isometrics only travel about 15 degrees on a uh, total seven and a half from each side before they're specific. I get that. But the catch is I only train them in the weakest position. Because if you checked his squat and he only moved it at the top range in the top 10%, they may be able to do a thousand, but he can only do 500 at the deepest position. So I only train the isometrics usually in the deepest position, unless there's some flaw in the athlete, which I have very little of those in regards to flaws in other positions. Okay. Uh, and, and what happens here is let's say the athlete drops into the isometric position at the bottom for 10 seconds. It's pretty crazy and phenomenal what happens to them in, uh, with the nervous system. Their body's ability, what it'll do is their brain sends that signal for 10 straight seconds in the weak position and the, the fibers and neuron, uh, and, and the neural pathways are refiring and refiring and refiring over that 10 seconds. Theoretically, thickening of the myelin sheath because it's something that is so intense, which is a good indicator that you have a good athlete. Okay. And again, um, just something to be aware of. The other reason that the, the heart rates dropped when we talked about in our first training was that you were able to get, um, there's more metabolically taxing, okay, in your training program, okay? Basically, I've kind of quantified a little bit that the ISOs are more metabolically taxing than the eccentrics. So if you think eccentric was hard, wait till they get to isometrics because of the range of motion you're only going through partial range of motion um or, or you're only in the weakest position for a split second in the eccentric phase where in the isometric phase you're in the deepest position in the weakest position the whole 10 seconds and what happens is you get some crazy amount of metabolic stress and i think that'll end it for my time on this lift hope you've enjoyed it